is Speaking with Gravity, and I am Curvin, one of your hosts. I'm D, And I'm Taisha. And on this podcast, we talk about mental health and how everything affects everything. You see, when you sit with a therapist, the conversation is different. With every episode, the goal is to have a conversation that makes you think, make you feel, make you do what's best for you. I'm a therapist, we're a therapist, but this isn't therapy. It's a podcast. So today we have another disclaimer. While we serve as mental health professionals, the information and content being discussed during our podcast is not intended to be utilized or substituted as therapy. The purpose of this broadcasting is to share our personal perspective through open dialogue about various content based on our personal, educational, and professional experiences. And once again, as I did uh, on a previous episode, we're introducing the QD of the hour, quote of a data. Uh, is our version of fun facts that <clears throat> gives you information that you'll be able to give to your friends, your family, your colleagues, your co-workers, your church members, uh, so that you can let them know that you know about mental health or whatever it is, whatever topic we're coming from. Today, this is an extension of um, the therapy edition that we did last episode. So, fun facts. I'm going to give you three of them once more and again. In individual therapy, I don't know if y'all would agree with this, some of y'all probably will. In individual therapy, a great therapist challenges a person's thoughts and behavior patterns. Um, Also, second fun fact, marital or couples therapy and family therapy require less time than than the average individual uh, treatment. They say marriage and couples is usually about 11 sessions, 11, 11 and a half sessions. I don't know if you could do a half a session, but um, 11 sessions and then family therapy would be nine sessions as opposed to individual um, therapy being 13 sessions. That was a new fact that I didn't know about. And then lastly, um, when you look at all the studies that have been done about which one is more, uh, the outcome is better, whether it be individual therapy or group therapy, they really couldn't come to a conclusion Mm -hmm. that individual was better than group. I would have thought individual would have been better, but based on, and there are some studies that will say group, and there are some studies that would say individual, but when you have all of them side by side, they come out about equal. That was surprising to me as well. So, um, again, this is an extension of the last episode. We talk about um, why to go to therapy, um, what therapy is about, uh, how to find a therapist. But um, we also want to just go a step further than that and talk about the different types of therapy. Now, there's a whole bunch, but we're going to focus on uh, individual, couples, family, and group therapy just to give you um, some insight onto that. But before we go to that, when we're talking about therapy, usually people think mental illness. As we mm. said previously, no. doesn't have to be mental illness. Uh, and also people get mental illness and mental health, I'm going to say confused. Mm-hmm. They use them interchangeably. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting one of these days. One of these days, I'm going to take. No, I'm not. I'm lying. (laughs) I'm not going to take no classes. I'm just going to be who I'm going to be. Mental illness and mental health. Um, So when we're talking mental illness and when we're talking mental health, y'all want to define that? I got my definition written down here um, that I want to give to the people. What what y'all say? I think of in terms when you're talking about mental health, health, and y'all know how I am with my analogies. Um, I think of health just being mental health being an overall well-being of your mental state. Um, so, um, just as your physical health is, it, it's really something that every person has. Um, you don't have to do anything to obtain it. Um, it's a natural born given aspect. So every person, young, age, elderly, whatever, has a mental health. When we talk about mental illness, I think of things that have occurred 
or are happening that alters your actual state of being, um, just as in relation to your physical health, right? So everybody has a physical health. We're all born with uh, certain conditions. And then um, as life occurs, there may be things that transpire within us. Um, you know, when you're talking about terminal illnesses and things of that nature, um, that's a, a mental health illness um, may be something that is... Um, something that is lifelong or it can be something that may just be occurring like you might get the flu or you might get a cold or you might um you know have sinuses or something that's something that may occur within um and you may need treatment or support in order to overcome it and sometimes it's a lifelong adjustment because it may be something that occurs um you know occasionally or as something happens and so therefore you may need support or assistance in getting it so when when we're talking about um mental health i think again it's the overall health of you know our mind um and our emotions um and our, our spacing and then when we're talking about mental illness we're talking about a direct impact to our mental health um and that can be mild it can be moderate or it can be severe and so you know and and as things transpire or as we go through certain things um that the stages of that may get worse right um depending on you know the intervention method. So, you know what I'm saying? Um, just as in with your physical health, again, you know, there's certain stages of cancer. If caught early enough, you know, um, treatment can prevent um, further exposure and things of that nature. However, if something goes on for an extended period of time, it may be get to a place of where it's irreversible and there's nothing more that can be done. And so that's the same thing with mental health. It, when things are happening, to us, you know, if caught early to really be addressed, um, there are techniques and practices that can be implemented to kind of resolve the issues that we may be experiencing on a mental and emotional or psychological aspect. Um, but if not, then it's something that can extend on and lead to severity of ment mental illness. That's what, not different. What say you, Miss um, Ty? Um, again, D kind of said that all in a nutshell, but I do think. Um, just like physical health, we all have mental health. Um, mental health involves effective functioning in our daily activities, resulting in productive activities such as work, school, um, healthy relationships, and our ability to adapt to change and cope with adversity. I found that definition on Google, by the way. Um, whereas <laughs> mental illness, it refers to collectively all diagnosable mental disorders such as anxiety disorder, uh, disorders, because there are different forms of anxiety, um, as well as mood disorders, we're talking about polar, depression, um, things of that nature. I love how you said uh, the ability to adapt. And you said ability to adapt and something else. Ability to adapt to change and cope with adversity. Okay. Um, I looked on Google too, right? <laughs> and mine said cope with stressors, but very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think in mental health, we don't just go around and say, uh, this person's in good mental health. We don't say that, do we? <laughs> right. But we probably should because mm -hmm. it's good mental health as well as bad mental health. Yeah. When we say mental health, we automatically go towards, oh, something's wrong, mm -hmm. something bad. But people literally can be in good mental health and they can go and do things to maintain that mental, that good mental health, or to put themselves in that good mental health. You know, we were just sitting here listening to uh, Big Sean, and he talks about meditation. That helps him, that helps lead him into good mental health and how to navigate through what we call life. Mm. You know, life is different for every single person. Um, and so their mental health is as you say it, impacted in so many ways by various things that we come across. And then that can lead into uh, mental illness um, by impairing us. But one of the things I saw that I don't think y'all mentioned, and I don't know how I feel about it, it said mental illness is an abnormal brain activity. Mm -hmm. And I know it can be in certain instances with certain diagnosis, but I don't know if I want to place that on every illness. And then again, I ain't a doctor. That's why I'm not a doctor, because I haven't went and studied it uh, as far. But uh, that that was one of the definitions. Um, and then, of course, based off of that abnormal brain activity, it affects your mood. It affects your behavior. And it impairs you um, to a degree that it affects how you function from day to day. 
that's probably the, the biggest thing though how do we function from day to day that's where your mental illness come in at if it stops you from doing what you would normally do mm-hmm. then that is a good sign that there is a, a, a problem things, yeah. yeah and so just to address well we, we said it previously you don't have to have a mental illness to come to therapy mm-hmm. in order to t- maintain a mental illness uh, I mean, may not, not maintain, mental maintain health. <laughs> good mental health. Right. Uh, <clears throat> therapy is a, is a, a good approach. And uh, the first one that comes to mind is individual mm-hmm. therapy. What does that look like? What does therapy look like? Individual therapy look like? And for me, it would be, um, I saw this too, understanding. Mm. somebody's history, understanding their fears, understanding their insecurities. When you talk insecurities, uh, what's what's her name? Brene Brown? Mm-hmm. She talks about being vulnerable. The mm. daring way. <sighs> did you, you did something with them, didn't you? Or you went to a training or something? I didn't participate in the daring way training offered by okay. Brene Brown, but I know... Um, a few clinicians that I met at the Black Therapist Rock who participated in that training, um, and I've heard great feedback from it. Definitely something I would look forward to doing. She also has a documentary. It may still be on Netflix. Um, I'm not sure, but if it is, I would encourage all of our listeners just to check it out. You know the name of that documentary? No, I don't know the name, but just type uh, in Brene Brown. Is yeah, it The Daring yeah. Way? Uh, I'm going to have to look it up real quick. Now, it might be The Daring Way, but yeah, it's it's a pretty good uh, documentary. I'm going to look it up uh, here while you give us your insight on individual therapy. You referring to me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I think of individual therapy looking as a one-on-one um, guide for um, life maintenance. Um, as you guys have stated, life happens to us. Uh, we all experience our own level of adversity um, and what that looks like from person to person is so different. Um, and one of the things that I think is so significant about individual therapy is that it is specifically um, geared towards helping that individual Um, you know, increase their mental health Um, because, you know, our mental wellness, you know, in terms of what we're looking at um, from a healthy standpoint. I like where you said good mental health um, because I think it really dismisses the stigma that mental health, when you're referring to it, we're always talking about it in terms of mental illness and it being negative. And I think when we look at the history of, you know, mental illnesses and things of that nature, um, and and I kind of have an issue kind of with that concept of um, abnormal, um, because I think when you start using that language, and again, I'm not a doctor either, this is just my personal aspect, um, constantly personal thoughts is that when you say the word abnormal then what defines normal and i and that normal normalcy for every person is going to be different based on where they are where they're located what they're experiencing and so that that definition for me didn't kind of go sit well but again (laughs) i digress so um you know really just kind of for me the individual as i stated is really that just one-on-one interaction of exploring what that individual needs in order to help them achieve uh, the functionality of their day-to-day interactions um and what they do yeah um and then you know when we talk in individual therapy too we have to think about uh, i saw another fact i guess you could say that says um progress in individual therapy comes a little bit faster i guess mm. it's i guess it could be common sense uh comes faster if you do it from week to week as opposed to bi-weekly mm. um but you know we talked about in the last episode homework exercises Mm -hmm. and with those homework exercises when you're going week to week number one i can i can assign you a homework assignment and then process it the next week and then i can give you another Another one one. Mm -hmm. um or if you didn't do well on that one 
we can reiterate what we did the previous week and figure out why you didn't do it, mm-hmm. as opposed to two weeks. Now I got to wait two weeks to see if you got it right or if you didn't get it right. All right. Um, and then we got to process that. Uh, so I can see how from week to week it would be going week to week as opposed to two weeks would be better. Um, and then the uh, the other thing I want to say when it comes down to individual therapy. Uh, we mentioned this again in the previous episode about asking questions. And uh, asking those questions, man, it can be anything from talking about your childhood to, like, right here, right now. Right now. Mm-hmm. And while we may think those things are insignificant, people think that they, those things are insignificant, they really do matter. Uh, for me, uh, I'm... I guess you could guess. I guess you can say I'm considered the middle child. Is uh, I'm one of four, right? And so it was my oldest brother, and he had that title of oldest brother. Mm-hmm. And then it was uh, myself, and then it's my sister. She had the title of being the only girl. girl right. right. And then I had my baby brother, and he had the title of baby, baby brother. Mm-hmm. And even to this day. Um, people would say to my mom if, if she's introducing me or if, if uh, I'm telling them who my mom is, it's like, oh, I didn't know she had four. And I'm, all <laughs> <laughs> I'm always the one that they, you know, conveniently uh, forgot about. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though I was the baby, however, uh, for about five or six years before my sister came. But um, people just didn't, didn't remember me. Well, that affects me, mm. right? And it affected me. Not, I, I guess it could have been negative mm. because, you know, as I, as I got older and once I got into really undergrad, started figuring out, my, finding my way and putting myself in the mm-hmm. forefront, forefront. Mm. right? Because now I, it, it's four of us, but don't nobody remember Curve. Don't nobody know Curve. Mm. Uh, and that just kind of propelled me into just kind of pushing myself along the way. And that's me being self-aware about it. Initially, right. I didn't, I didn't recognize that. I didn't realize that. And when you come to therapy, stuff like that will come out. Mm. And you know, it's different for everybody. You know, you can be somebody can have that same birth order as myself and uh, a four, and it not affect them it's in a way that it affected me. Mm. Um, so we uh, individual therapy. It is it, just that. It's individual to that person. Mm. And again, like we've mentioned before, that session is only for you. Whatever you want that session to be about is going to be about, for the most part, and you said something too about that, um, that therapists sometimes can lead. Uh, or uh, there are times, you know, someone come in, I might have a thought process, of, okay, this is what we're going to discuss today based off of some other things that we've, that has come about. Um, what do family therapy look like as opposed to individual? I mean, it's kind of, <clears throat> I'm not going to say it's kind of simple, um, because for yeah. us, it, for us, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, but, uh, we'll Yo, we... down the road. family therapy is just a form of treatment designed to address specific issues affecting the health and the functioning of a family. Um, it can be, family therapy can be used to help a family through a difficult period. You mentioned major transitions um, mm, or yeah. mental or behavioral health problems in a certain family member. Um, and understanding that when we're in a family unit, what affects one individual can have a direct impact and effect on other members in the family so therefore there can cause some uh dysfunction within the family unit in addition to other things yep um i think i pretty much summed that up i think you know when you're looking at family therapy i think a lot of times people assume um or define family just to direct correlation is to, you know, my mom or sister, sibling. But I think family therapy in terms can be anyone that you value in your life um, or who has a substance role, a sub, 
a role of substance um, in your life um, because, you know, family looks different for all of us in terms of who we interact with and who we engage with. Um, and sometimes the people that we know um, best or sometimes the people that know us best um, is who we perceive to be family. Um, traditional family therapy um, does consist, um, you know, generally of, you know, your parentals. Um, mm -hmm. and children and things of that that type of form um, but as we see you know with life things are changing changing that dynamics um, as society continues to advance and, and as we continue to redefine what family truly looks like uh, I like how you said uh, family is be goes beyond individuals it goes into the group you're mm -hmm. looking at the family as a whole um, then they got something called family systems therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but looking at the dynamics of it, you're looking at the group as a whole. We hadn't mentioned this, but or you, I guess you kind of just alluded to it just now about blended families. Families, right. Um, and then even with blended families, like you got to think if um, a single mother has a child, one child, mm -hmm. and then she meets a um, single father who has one child, and those two get together, those children are used to being the only child. Maybe. Right? Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they could be used to being the only child. Uh, or it, them being a group together, like right. the mom and, and the dad, I mean the mom and the child and the dad and the child. And now they got to come together and figure out how we're going to do this thing. Not only about how um, they individually feel, but systems like right who who is going to be the disciplinarian who's going to um uh, it's it's so much there's so many different even, avenues yeah. that you can go in when you're looking at family um treatment and and sometimes you know a person may be seeking individual's treatment especially when you're dealing with children oftentimes family treatment or family therapy is going to be strongly encouraging in some instances mandated because um, the really direct influences of a, a child or a young adult is going to be uh, really associated associated with their family mm -hmm. whoever you know they're they're being brought up or raised in the system or um, of, of what they're experiencing is really going to be controlled about or by who they're around who who they have that close connection with um, and so oftentimes you know I, I know from you know practicing that's what was expected working with young children is family therapy had to be a part of their treatment um, and I think when you're looking at the dynamics again of family you really have to kind of explore a little bit kind of what Ty was saying is that uh, the decisions and the behaviors and the actions of individuals within that family have a direct and indirect influence on those who are directly connected. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And especially when you're sharing a house a household or a, a space and just like you mentioned you know blending families um you talk about it from a disciplinary action but i think about it even from the aspects of really for a lot of people um sometimes your home is your safest spacing mm -hmm. and so anytime someone else comes into that spacing that you're not a hundred percent comfortable with you know it's just like having company you know it's it's you know even in your own home it's it's good but you know there's certain things you may or may not do or engage in because you have company and until you get to a place where you can feel comfortable with that person it's almost like they company you know what i'm saying even though you know yeah. the dynamics of the relationships <laughs> the titles change but yeah. like you company and so we have to get into that adjustment in that climate or flip the opposite of that you may have been in a, a family unit and now you're separating you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. or you get you're seeking a divorce and so the dynamics of a family is changing you're still a family but we're not staying in the same household and so we may have to go to therapy to really just kind of process through the emotions surrounding that separation um the emotions surrounding what that is going to look like now where you know we are spending um weekends with each other now we may be spending you know every other weekend or just you know summers or whatever the case may be and a lot of times that's hard for every person involved especially when children are involved or especially when there's still a lot of emotion surrounding that aspect yeah as you're talking about it 
uh, I don't know. Y'all know about that that A score? Yeah. That adverse, adverse childhood, childhood experiences. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then you said safe space. And it's like, man, how important mm-hmm. is family? Like, I was extremely blessed not to have to experience, you know, everything that adverse childhood. And when I say A score, I'm talking about adverse childhood experiences. That's what mm-hmm. A stands for, A-C-E. And that score, the higher the score, if I'm not mistaken, the more um, sev- the more opportunity you have to, um, the more open you are to uh, mental health issues and um, uh, illnesses and other- because of what you've experienced. And we all know trauma comes from what you experience. And so the, mo- the more negative things that you experience, that's adverse, the more negative things you experience, the more likely you are to have that trauma, which then is going to affect your brain activity. Mm-hmm. That's going to affect how you see the world, your perception of the world. And it if can. You, it is. What you mean? I it think can? it can because, um, you know, using from my own, and I and I truly support the ace, but I okay. also think there also are your rules of exception. I think, um, you know, because when I completed the testing, I think I scored maybe like a. Eight, nine, okay, something like that, which is really classified as a higher level of adverse trauma um, and experiences. And based on you know what they said, <laughs> they said um, is likely to occur. Um, by grace, did not happen to me. But again, right. that's why I say it's, it. It can um, truly impact you, and, and it, it it's not uncommon. But it does not mean that just because you have that level of scoring that you ought to automatically get placed into that category. That's what I was trying to say. Oh, okay. Not, okay. D- not yeah, discrediting yeah. the yeah. value of it, but not just saying, you know, automatically if um, you administered that test and you, you score a certain rating, um, that it automatically means you're you're severely mental Ill, mentally ill or anything. Yeah, capacity. yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. And even when I scored it, like, I, again, I think I come from a pretty good mm-hmm. family, but when you start looking at, like, some of the experiences that I've had, I've witnessed either mm-hmm. directly or indirectly, indirectly. That, that score goes mm-hmm. a little bit higher than I would want it to go right. up well, because of the indirect with. exposure and uh, the physical location mm-hmm. that I was at. Like, you know, you, you see stuff mm. because you in a certain area, area of town or a certain city or a certain state. Um, man, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be in some of these places that we hear about on TV, but that's neither a, another subject for another day. But family therapy is important just to be able to process. And when we're thinking about trauma, that that's what we think about and processing. I, I like how you, you mentioned that, though, because I think oftentimes people don't understand the significant impact of our own decisions or our um, behaviors because, you know, when we're going through it, we just trying to get through it. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? But really the the decisions, the behaviors, the location, because where I choose to stay at, really there's a lot of dynamics in there. Mm-hmm. One, housing availability, financial situation. So there's a lot of things as an adult that, you know, I'm trying to encompass. But that's a direct impact to my child, too, as mm-hmm. well. You know, the, the things that you're experiencing and how your score, as you acknowledge, is altered by decisions that weren't made by you. Mm-hmm. And this is why the dynamic of family therapy is so encouraged, especially amongst children, and oftentimes needed because there are these direct consequences that are not a result of this child's decision, right? And a lot of times their behaviors or their responses to certain things um, is because of these indirect exposures or experiences that they are having that they really don't have a way of changing it. I can not want to stay in the neighborhood as a child, but if my family can't afford to live over here or to drive this or to whatever the case may be, we just can't afford it. And that's my reality. And so, you know, again, that can create, you know, more likelihood to crime exposures, more likelihood to gun violence or whatever the case may be or access to drugs or whatever the situation was, which I think, as you you mentioned and kind of stated, increases uh the number of frequency in our in our scores and, and when you say uh these decisions that i didn't make that goes into a couples therapy marriage right. therapy like these husband wives these couples what you do affects the people around you the kids and everybody around you mm. 
um, when we when we when we picking people, I don't think I don't even know if we realizing. I don't think we realizing what happens. You know, whatever that person went through with their family, uh, growing up, can influence how your family dynamics is, how they're going to um, discipline their kids or raise their kids or what ideas are important to them. Um, and then, and even with family, I mean, not family, uh, couples therapy, that can come out as well. Mm. If we are not, if there's not an issue, there's not a problem, let's say we're doing pre-counseling um, mm. before we get married or before we take the next step to whatever commitment it is. Now some of those things, these questions, Mm. that the therapist is, is is doing or these exercises. I love to do exercises with couples. Couples is my favorite. <laughs> um, it's my favorite form of therapy. But these exercises that we do will bring some things to the forefront that wasn't necessarily there. You know, people don't always talk about um, re- religion or spirituality. People don't always even talk about sex and what I like, what I dislike. It just kind of happens, right? But when you're in that therapeutic setting, it's like, okay, let's see how you really mm-hmm. feel about this. Where, um, what do you really want, or what do you really not like? Um, yeah, that's. I, I ain't mean to kind of go <laughs> over there, but what what do you think about? Or what do y'all think about with couples therapy? Um, couple therapy for me um, is, is very vital um, and important. I think it's it is really significant, and I, and I like the concept you introduced of probably being more pro, kind of taking a proactive stance um, towards it to bring the dialogue um, and consideration of a person's um, upbringing and other dynamics to how it is affecting the relationship. Um, I think sometimes, you know, when people that seems somewhat of a foreign language to say I'm going to go to couple theories P but we're not having relationship issues is as if is if you're trying to create an issue but it's actually giving you an opportunity to really do um, and look at things in a different light. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people oftentimes don't want to go to couples therapy until an issue has already, you know, until something has escalated. But sometimes, like you said, there are signs in the beginning that let you know, okay, there's some things we don't agree on. And I think as therapists, you know, we are, are, are mental health professionals. Um, we have the ability to bring it out and kind of work through those things a little bit differently mm-hmm. when there's not this defense mechanism of an issue Mm -hmm. already being present um and i think it's important to really think about is it couples therapy that's needed or is it individual therapy that is needed i've had couples come before and really they were having couple issues but a lot of the couple issues they were having is because individually they hadn't addressed certain things Mm -hmm. and so it's hard to work towards a couple's goal when individually we have so much we need to accomplish um and so you know the recommendation was made let's focus on getting you guys involved in some individual therapy first um you know not taking away from what you're experiencing and maybe even you know making sure that you have an outlet where you both kind of get your own needs uh, uh, accustomed to so then as you're growing in advance and now when you come back in to have this couple's advancement you're able to do so from from a free space Mm -hmm. where the you know because in couples therapy I'm not saying who's right or wrong. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to find the medium and get to you guys. But in individual therapy, you really get to explore um, and talk more about um, what it is that you specifically need. So I I like couples therapy, um, really encourage it. But I also think you have to be conscious of when you engage in such treatment. And you can do, uh, I've seen people do couples and individual like they have their own mm, yeah own individual therapist and then they have the the couples therapist maybe they had the individual before and then mm, decided sure. to do mm. the couples thing um and again going back to not necessarily assessment but we can say in consultation that can be kind of discussed in the consultation do we need individual as opposed to couples or do we want to try it you know this way um and then when you I also like when you said something about uh, being on the defensive. When you're doing a, when there's an argument, right? Um, 
or when there's a disagreement. Sometimes we're just trying to win. The 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 the, the, the uh, we said this in what the, the episode <laughs> the, so, about yeah. um, toxic communication. Yeah. Um, sometimes you're just trying to win that argument, or you're trying to get your way in whatever the problem is, as opposed to when you're coming into therapy, you got an unbiased person who's there to really get to the root of the problem. Maybe the root of the problem is trust. Maybe the root of the problem is communication. You know, um, you know, somebody saying, well, you need to be in the house by one o'clock because you're a committed person. Maybe it's not one o'clock. Maybe one o'clock isn't the, the number. Maybe it's just trust that we're dealing with. And we need to, to figure out how to establish that and make it so that um, one is not that. This is, well, I don't even want, I don't want to Well, I think, that. too, I, I like what you're thinking about because, to me, it's about identifying those triggers because yeah. I think that's what you're going to and that's what you're kind of referencing when you say looking at the bigger picture because in a relationship, yeah, we can have a disagreement, but what you said to me may have triggered something that occurred to me in my childhood that you didn't even mean it in that way, but because that's been my experience with people people um you know trying to tell me what to do i don't i don't like that you know so it it isn't about what you're saying or even about what we're discussing but it's more about how that's making me feel and again that's sometimes why we have to revert to um you know potentially seeking individual therapy because that's more of a that's something personal that's really not about that person um but it's about what i'm experiencing on the inside and how i'm internalizing what we're having um you often often can see this sometimes as well when people are engaging in a in um and I, people say argument, but I like to say sometimes just a disagreement um, because it, it is almost like you can't really, you know what I'm saying? I can't say that I was wrong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or, you know, I'm, I'm not able to really take ownership for, you know, my thoughts or my feelings. And, and that, again, is personal. That really has nothing to do with the other person. And it's it. it it can result, come from pride. It can come from whatever. But it's just the lack of being able to really say, you know what, this has nothing to do with X, Y, Z. This has something to do with me. Um, and again, I like couples therapy because sometimes it <laughs> explores that. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So I think you just, as a person, you really have to choose choose your fit. What works for you and what are you in need of? Is this a couples issue? Meaning that this person, you know, is a trigger in, in how we communicate and how we, uh, you know, talk to each other or how we work through things are unsuccessful? Or is it that I have some personal issues that I'm going through and I'm dealing with that I need to seek uh, assistance and get clarification on so I can better serve this relationship? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, we can talk about couples staying for a day. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can dig that. Um, even with the, the rules to fighting, right? Right. Because um, sometimes when people are having disagreements, what do they do? They tend to go from one situation to the next instead of figuring it out. But um, outside of, so we talked about individual therapy. We talked about family therapy. We then eased over into couples therapy, group therapy. Mm. Um, like I said earlier, there's no real difference between group. Uh, well, based on the studies, you're going to see, you're going to have studies that say individual is better. You're going to have some studies that say group is better. But they about even, right? Mm. So we can't really, um, for certain, say that one is better than the other. One of the things I like about group therapy is you get the, it's a it's a ideal of what real life is about, right? Because when you're in individual therapy, that person is reporting mm. what things were like in between sessions. When you're in a group setting, sometimes you can see how people interact with others. Right. Um, and based on what they go into group therapy for, it, that can be really significant. It can be really relevant because I can see how you engage in people. I can see how your communication is as opposed to you just telling me. Uh, and it's an opportunity for you to utilize some of those techniques and coping skills that we would get right there in that setting. Not just in, in a role model, I and mean not uh, a role play exercise, but just amongst other group members. Uh, I like that about group therapy. When I think about group therapy, though, I think about the idea of the support 
that group therapy um, basically creates. You know, I think a lot of times when people are experiencing situations, it's easily to feel like I'm the only person going through it. Um, you know, or this only is happening to me. But when you're getting to it in a group and you're hearing yeah. other people share their experiences and you're saying, okay, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? This, yeah. It, that it kind of normalizes, um, you know, what you're encountering and really can be empowering in, you know, seeing people who are, transitioning through it or people who've came out on the opposite side um for and I, I do like the aspect that you said i think group is beneficial depending on what the actual situation um or circumstance is um i think it also gives you an opportunity to really be able to openly create a relationship with somebody who um really can share your experiences in terms of really knowing kind of what it's like to be going through that i, I think you're going to see that dynamic a lot in like people who suffer with addictions um or individuals who may be experiencing grief or loss um that's when i feel like um are some of the most significant times when group therapy is therapy is probably the most powerful and influential because that's the times when people really get to really just be kind of release themselves in a spacing where you you know there's no no judgment because everybody in here is battling something or is experiencing some similarity versus where individual again it kind of just feels like you know why am i feeling this way or I, i'm really angry that so and so passed away but when i get into a group and somebody else says you know what i'm still angry and i'm still hurt about mm -hmm. this you know it, and it's been 10 years versus you know what i'm saying just me feeling like it's I got to be the only person. And I think individual and group, I don't think that, that you can kind of weigh them out as which is beneficial. I just feel like it's based on what you need at that point um, where you are. And now oftentimes you may be referred, you may start out an individual and your therapist may offer you to individual. join um, a group in addition to receiving that individual treatment as a way to really kind of build that network for those people who may not already be having it. Yeah, that's that's a good point about the benefits yeah. uh, of individual and group. And ultimately, I think it comes back to the actual person, person. Yeah. the therapist, uh, who is leading the group, and the therapist who's doing the individual, the individual therapy. You can't get beyond that relationship or that alliance that you have with that person. That, and I, I'm saying relationship, I'm saying alliance, but it really boils down to a vibe. Like, energy. do I, do this person get me, and do I get that person? You know. Uh, and you what you say energy? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm with that. Uh, and we got on here uh, uh, talking about payment, and you know, very much like uh, the last episode. I don't know. You you might have more insight on this one. Um, group therapy. Do insurance pay for that? I I'm still learning the insurance part of it. Currently, uh, the private practice I'm at, I don't do insurance, but I'm learning more about that. Do you know, Ty? I don't. I do know I've had some individuals who have gone through group. Um, there are um, some insurances that pay for group. I think it you really have to be able to justify. And again, kind of how we mentioned in the other episode, it kind of has had to, it has to be documented as being valuable to your treatment. Um, and so you really may want to explore that from a therapeutic stance um, with your insurance company just to make sure. Also, you too want to look at the institutions because as you indicated, some private practices um, may not offer that type of uh, mm -hmm. treatment. So looking at it. Um, and it just it depends. And so, sometimes groups aren't really cost-based um, in terms of Sometimes because they can be just support groups, so it may not right, be right. any cost associated. So it just kind of depends on what kind of group you're attending. Yeah. But from a therapeutic standpoint, again, um, there are some some insurances that, that pay for it. I know that because I provided group therapy um, before. But, again, I, to, to say that yours will do it yeah. is best to make sure you check with your actual insurance company. Um, I do know, uh, like you were saying, support groups are typically free. Uh, sometimes they refer to them as wellness groups. Right. Um, a lot of uh, group therapy um, that I know of around this area is addiction or substance abuse oriented, mm -hmm. and I believe insurance is paid for that. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about other types of groups, then that's something you have to, number one, talk with the, the therapist about and um, or the person that's providing it, and then your insurance company as well. Also, usually, typically, 
that group therapy is the less cost if you did have to pay for it mm-hmm. out of pocket. I have no idea what that cost would be. Um, I can't say it would be half or not, but it would be significantly cheaper than individual therapy in most cases. Because there again, there are a couple of people in there, so they're all paying a smaller Small amount portion, yeah. for a smaller portion for the same amount of time, basically. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned this, but most, most of those sessions are 60 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think groups are more like 90 minutes. Um, but uh, you definitely have uh, 60, uh, 60 minute sessions, uh, 50 to 60 minute sessions when we're talking about individual, when we're talking about family, and when we're talking about couples therapy. Group therapy is a little bit different in that they may do 60 and they may do 90, depending on what it is. Um, and then there are some other groups that uh, has to do with um, domestic violence. Right. Uh, and that are, you know, you have to go through the courts and all of that stuff. Or sometimes you go through the courts and they they say that you got to do that as part of your the conditions that they assign to you based off of whether you've been charged and convicted of it. Uh, but with, with treatment, there again, talk to the person that you're inquiring about these services with and then um, also look at your actual insurance company. Mm-hmm. Uh, over the last two episodes, we've given you guys, uh, we've talked to b- talk about just the initial thing, uh, finding a the therapist, why therapy is good, uh, how to go about that process, and then we came back and followed it up in this episode about the different types of therapy, mm-hmm. um, which is a good, pretty good overview, you know, Maybe a year from now we'll come back and do it again. Uh, again, if you guys have anything that y'all want us to talk about, feel free to reach out to us and let us know. Once again, um, I'm one of your hosts, Curvin. We also have D. We also have Ty. We're on Facebook. We're on, in- we're on Instagram under Speaking with Gravity. If we said something to make you think that you can use therapy or seek a, a professional in your area, then reach out to us uh, if need be. And um, through a message DM or something, and then we'll try to get back with you and point you in the right direction. Thank you to Vision Winning Productions. Thank you to all of those who support us and encourage us to continue to do what we do. And you're going to need to stop playing that while I'm doing my outro. Uh, (laughs) Thank you for taking the time to listen. You could be doing anything uh, right now, but you chose to listen to us, and we appreciate that. Again, shout out to anybody that listened and support us. Remember, We're therapists, but this ain't therapy. It's a podcast.